you can see five planets with just your eyes. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, all of them show up as bright dots in the night sky if you know where to look. Even Uranus, under perfect conditions, might just barely be visible. But Neptune, you'd never see it. It's too far, too dim, too distant. Averaging 30 astronomical units from the Sun, roughly 4.5 billion kilometers, its immense distance makes it the outermost of the eight planets. In fact, it's the only planet in our solar system that was discovered before it was ever seen. And we've barely looked at it since. Now with the James Webb Space Telescope, we're finally seeing Neptune again, not in visible light, but through heat and haze in wavelengths no human eye could see. And what it's showing us is strange, a planet colder than ever recorded, a glowing ring system no one expected, and auroras that stretch across latitudes in ways we don't understand. So what is this place really? What's happening on Neptune? And why does it still feel like a planet we barely know? In the early 1800s, astronomers were tracking Uranus, a planet that had only recently joined the list. Over the years, they noticed something strange. It wasn't moving exactly the way it should. Its orbit kept drifting slightly, but consistently away from where Newton's laws said it should be. At first, they blamed the data. Maybe it was an observational error. Maybe it was just the limits of their telescopes. But then came Urbain Le Verrier, a mathematician who didn't buy the idea that the data was the problem. He figured the problem wasn't with Uranus. It was with something else pulling on it, something they hadn't seen yet. He took the anomalies and the tiny discrepancies in Uranus's orbit and used them to reverse engineer the position of the unknown object. Not roughly, precisely. He calculated where in the sky this planet had to be for the numbers to make sense. He didn't know what it looked like. He didn't know how big it was, just that it had to be there. That alone is impressive, but what happened next is what made history. He sent his findings to Johann Galle, an astronomer in Berlin. Galle pointed his telescope exactly where the math told him to look, and that same night, Neptune was found. First try, exact location. A planet, discovered not by sight, but by math. That's never happened before, and it hasn't happened since. Neptune is the only planet we've ever found without seeing it first. It revealed itself through gravity, pulling on Uranus just enough to leave fingerprints. That was the clue. And it worked. It's also worth pointing out what that discovery didn't do. It didn't launch an era of Neptune exploration. There were no telescopic campaigns, no sudden flurry of attention. It was noted, confirmed, and then mostly ignored for over a century. Part of the problem was how far Neptune is. It's dim. It moves slowly. It doesn't grab attention the way Saturn or Jupiter do. The only thing that made Neptune visible was math, and math doesn't glow. A few days after Neptune was confirmed, astronomers found its largest moon, Triton. But even that didn't shift the focus. Neptune stayed in the background. Not much detail, no missions, no plans, just a confirmed dot at the edge of the system. We've only been to Neptune once, and it wasn't a mission designed just for Neptune either. It was Voyager 2 doing its grand tour of the outer planets. It flew past Jupiter, then Saturn, Uranus, and finally, in 1989, it reached Neptune. That was the last stop before heading out into interstellar space. It didn't orbit, it didn't slow down, it just flew straight through. But in that one pass, it gave us almost everything we know about Neptune today. It got closer to Neptune than it did to any other planet, just 5,000 kilometers above the cloud tops. That close approach gave us our first real images of the planet. Not just a blur, not just a dot, but proper high resolution photos. And what those images showed was not at all what scientists expected. At nearly 49,000 kilometers across, almost four times Earth's diameter, Neptune revealed itself as a colossal ice giant. They thought Neptune would be calm, cold, distant, and probably uneventful. But Voyager saw movement, fast winds, active weather, huge systems swirling across the atmosphere. That's when it recorded the fastest winds in the solar system. 
over 2,000 kilometers per hour. On a planet that gets barely any sunlight, that made no sense at all. You're not supposed to have that much atmospheric energy that far from the sun. Something internal must be powering it, but even now, we still don't know exactly how. It also found the Great Dark Spot. That was the highlight of a massive, Earth-sized storm churning near the equator. A huge vortex, almost like Jupiter's Great Red Spot, is spinning in the opposite direction of the planet's rotation. It looked permanent, but when Hubble looked again just a few years later, it was gone. That was the first clue that Neptune's storms don't stick around. They appear, they move, and then they vanish completely, which makes the planet even harder to understand. Voyager also confirmed the presence of rings. They're not like Saturn's or even Uranus's. They're faint, patchy, and uneven. Some parts are bright, others are almost invisible. These weird incomplete arcs don't behave the way ring systems normally do, and we still don't know what's keeping them from spreading out into a full circle. And then there were the moons. Voyager discovered six new ones, small and irregular, tightly orbiting close to the planet. It also gave us our first look at Triton, but that's a whole topic on its own. The magnetic field was another surprise. It wasn't aligned with the planet's core and it wasn't centered either. It was tilted and offset, just like what Voyager saw at Uranus. That tells us something strange is going on inside Neptune. Maybe the magnetic field is being generated in a layer higher than the core, or maybe the planet's structure is just fundamentally different from what we thought. Voyager sent back as much data as it could during the past, and then it was gone. We've never sent anything else. Every image we've had since has come from telescopes, most of them from millions or even billions of kilometers away. So, when we say we've only visited Neptune once, we really mean it. One spacecraft, one chance, and that was over 35 years ago. The atmosphere on Neptune is more extreme than anything we've seen. It's got supersonic winds faster than the speed of sound, faster than anything on Jupiter, even though Neptune gets less than one ten thousandth of the sunlight Earth does, somehow it has more violent motion in its clouds than any other planet. That's the puzzle. Where's the energy coming from? It's not coming from the sun, that's clear. And it's not just leftover heat from the planet's formation either. Uranus, which is almost the same size and composition, barely shows any heat from its core. But Neptune does. In fact, Neptune radiates more than twice as much energy as it receives from the sun. That extra energy has to come from inside, but what exactly is going on beneath the clouds, we still don't know. What we do know is that Neptune's atmosphere is layered and unstable. There are high altitude clouds made of methane ice, floating above deeper weather bands that seem to shift constantly. It's not just spinning, it's boiling. Some regions are brighter, some darker, and you'll get sudden shifts from one observation to the next. Even the seasons are bizarre. Neptune has a tilt that's similar to Earth's 28.3 degrees, so it does experience seasons, but each one lasts about 40 Earth years. That's how long it takes the Sun to slightly favor one hemisphere over the other. This happens because Neptune takes about 165 years to orbit the Sun, meaning we've only seen it complete one full orbit since its discovery in 1846. And even though the light it gets is incredibly weak, the difference is enough to trigger visible changes. During the current southern spring, Neptune's southern hemisphere actually looks brighter. That's because the small rise in temperature is enough to unlock frozen methane trapped in the lower layers, which then drifts upward and forms new haze in the upper atmosphere. Just to be clear, we're talking about a 10 degree temperature change. That's all it takes. A barely noticeable shift by Earth standards, but on Neptune, it kicks off a chain reaction in the chemistry and cloud structure. In recent years, telescopes like Hubble and Webb have picked up signs that Neptune's atmosphere is cooling rapidly. Over the past few decades, temperatures in the stratosphere have dropped dramatically, far more than anyone expected. No one knows why. It could be a seasonal cycle or something deeper changing inside the planet, but either way, it's not consistent with our models. Before we get into what James Webb actually saw, it's important to point out that Webb didn't show up to an empty stage. 
Hubble has been watching Neptune since the 1990s, and while it doesn't have the same resolution or infrared range as Webb, it's been the only consistent eye we've had on the planet for over three decades. If Voyager gave us the first look, Hubble gave us the follow-up. Its ultraviolet sensitivity uniquely pierces the haze to track faint storms, a capability no other observatory matches for the ice giants. One of the earliest things Hubble noticed was that Neptune's storms didn't stop after Voyager left. In 1994, it spotted a new dark vortex in the Northern Hemisphere. More storms followed in 2015, in 2018, and again in 2020. These weren't small features either. They were massive systems, and they behaved unpredictably. One of them even did something unusual. Instead of drifting toward the equator and disappearing, it reversed direction and moved back toward the pole. That broke the expected trend and left researchers wondering what was actually going on inside Neptune's atmosphere. As Ken Bollinger, Voyager analyst, marveled in 1989, every day what you see is brand new, changes going on constantly, very, very fast. These vortices may spawn from shear between atmospheric bands traveling at varying speeds, sustaining themselves until they stray from their energy sources and fade, much like the small dark spots shade shift from dark to light as Voyager approached. It also tracked the short-lived bright clouds, high-altitude methane clouds that seem to cluster around these storms. Sometimes they'd appear in advance of a vortex forming. Other times, they'd wrap around the storm or appear at the edges. These clouds weren't stable, they'd change shape brightness, and position in a matter of days. That kind of variability told scientists that the deeper atmosphere, the part we can't directly see, was constantly shifting. Then in 2013, Hubble found something else. A new moon. Tiny, just about 34 kilometers wide, orbits just outside the ring system. They called it Hippocamp. What made it interesting wasn't just that it was small, but that it had probably been missed by Voyager entirely which makes you wonder how much more is still hiding out there. Hubble also refined our knowledge of Neptune's other inner moons like Naiad and Thalassa. Their orbits are tilted and slightly offset, almost as if they're weaving around each other in a timed pattern to avoid collision. Without continuous tracking, that kind of motion would have been almost impossible to spot. But maybe the most important discovery was about Neptune's temperature, not on the surface, but higher up in the stratosphere. Using infrared measurements across nearly two decades, Hubble found that the planet was cooling. And not gradually. From 2003 to 2018, the stratosphere dropped in temperature by almost 8 degrees Celsius. Then suddenly, around 2018, the South Pole started warming up. That kind of swing doesn't fit cleanly into Neptune's seasonal cycle. The changes happened too fast and without a clear external cause. It suggests that something internal, or something about Neptune's chemistry might be driving these patterns. But again, without being there, we're guessing. So, Hubble didn't solve Neptune, it just made the mystery harder to ignore. It showed that Neptune wasn't sitting still. Those storms kept forming and fading, that new moons could still be discovered. The temperature didn't follow the rules. It set the stage for what came next, because by the time Webb finally turned its mirrors toward Neptune, it wasn't about getting the first image. It was about finally seeing what all those changes actually looked like beneath the haze. When Webb first captured Neptune in 2022, it gave us a version of the planet that didn't look anything like the classic blue world people were expecting. Instead of deep ocean colors, it showed a pale, almost transparent planet with sharp rings and thin, bright methane ice clouds. It was the first truly clear infrared look since Voyager 2, and it reminded everyone that Webb sees Neptune in heat and structure, not color. That 2022 image revealed the rings cleanly for the first time in more than three decades and showed multiple cloud layers stacked high above the atmosphere. It was impressive, but that was just Webb's first look. The real change came with the new image released in 2025. This one didn't just show structure, it showed Neptune actually glowing. Webb captured bright patches of infrared light scattered across the planet at mid-latitudes, 
which immediately stood out because auroras on most planets form near the poles. But Neptune's magnetic field is tilted by almost 47 degrees, and that tilt pushes charged particles into unexpected parts of the atmosphere. In the 2025 image, Webb caught those regions lighting up. These weren't faint details. The glow was strong, clear, and completely different from what we saw in 2022. Alongside the brightness, Webb's 2025 spectral data detected strong signals from H3+, a molecule that appears when charged particles collide with the upper atmosphere. That's basically confirmation that the glow we're seeing is real auroral activity, happening right now on Neptune. And it gives us a new way to study the planet's temperature, energy flow, and the way its atmosphere reacts to the magnetic field. We've sent multiple missions to Mars, we've orbited Jupiter and Saturn for years, we've flown by Pluto, we've even dropped a probe on Titan, and yet Neptune, this massive, complex, mysterious planet, has had no visitors since 1989. And the longer we wait, the more we realize how much we're missing. Every time a new telescope like Webb gets pointed at Neptune, we get a handful of new questions. To really understand Neptune, we need to be there. Not just passing by, we need something in orbit. Watching it daily. Seeing how the clouds form, how storms evolve, how heat moves through the layers. We need instruments that can measure their magnetic field up close, track particles in the rings, and maybe even drop a probe into the atmosphere to see how deep the turbulence goes. Beneath that hazy blue layer lies a world of water, ammonia, and methane ices wrapped around a rocky core, crushed by pressures reaching about 700 gigapascals. That's 7 million times the pressure at Earth's sea level. Deep inside, scientists think methane could break apart under that pressure, forming diamond hailstones that fall through a hot, dense ocean of carbon, glowing faintly like embers in the dark. Such extreme conditions, once only recreated in small lab experiments, give clues to why Neptune's interior is so active, while Uranus seems strangely quiet. That inner heat may still be rising from Neptune's violent birth, keeping the planet alive with motion, while Uranus was left colder and more still after a massive ancient impact. And it's not just about Neptune for Neptune's sake. The ice giants, Neptune and Uranus, make up the most common type of planet in the galaxy. Most of the exoplanets we've found so far are Neptune-sized. If we can't understand the ones in our own backyard, how are we supposed to understand the thousands we're finding around other stars? That's why scientists keep pushing for a dedicated Neptune mission. Something like a flagship orbiter with instruments designed specifically for the outer solar system. There are concepts like NASA's Neptune Odyssey proposal, but nothing's been greenlit. Not yet. These missions take decades to plan, build, and launch. And if we don't start soon, we'll be sitting here another 30 years from now, still wondering what this planet is really like. China has also proposed a Neptune probe, aiming for a possible 2033 launch. If it happens, it could either fly past Neptune or go into orbit, giving us a new look at the planet's atmosphere, rings, and magnetic field. It might even uncover what drives Neptune's auroras or explain the strange behavior of its ring arcs. Discoveries that could arrive long before NASA overcomes its funding and scheduling challenges, because right now we have just enough data to know we're missing the full picture. We've got a planet with extreme winds, short-lived storms, mysterious rings, internal heat that doesn't add up, a moon that looks like it doesn't even belong, and an atmosphere that's changing in ways no one can fully explain. And we're still watching from across the solar system like it's fine. If there's one world that deserves our attention, not because it's easy, not because it's flashy, but because it might change everything we thought we knew about planets, it's Neptune. So the question isn't whether there's more to learn. The question is, what are we still waiting for?